I'm Del the Trader, and welcome to Bear vs. Pig. This is a series of interviews with seasoned day traders who have found themselves trading inside one of the stock market's most volatile and shrouded niches. These are traders that have managed to break through the gauntlet that is discretionary day trading, they've become profitable, and have emerged on the other side triumphant. Let's lift the veil and begin exploring the minds behind this niche. Today on episode 5, I'm interviewing Stan Glusman from Seven Points Capital, aka at Chicana Trader on Twitter. Stan trades small to microcap stocks, but also trades larger cap names. Stan has been described to me as a beast of a trader, likely because of the size he trades and his conviction in the name. Stan, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, thanks, Del, for inviting me, man. Uh, thanks for this podcast. There's a lot of great information. There's a lot of uh, killers on the podcast, so I'm honored to be on it. So thanks for inviting me. Anytime. I've really been wanting to pick your brain. Uh, we've struck up a bit of a friendship, so I'm happy to get to know you a little bit more in this episode um, and uh, answer some of the questions that we've had from the community as well. Awesome. Let's do it, man. Uh, so for people that don't know who you are, maybe tell us a little bit about what you trade, uh, your current position at Seven Points Capital, um, and also where you're trading from right now. Uh, thanks, Del. Um, my name's Stan, Stan Glusman, at Chocana Trader on Twitter. Um, I trade momentum. Uh, so I, I like to trade SSR stocks. I like to scalp them. Um, I like to trade the piggies, you know, fade the piggies. Sometimes I go long. I call that uh, reverse short. Uh, somebody, uh, somebody wrote that on Twitter. So I like to go reverse short sometimes. And I like to trade high beta stocks for momentum like Netflix and uh, Tesla, uh, those type of names. And um, I trade at seven points as a prop trader. So I am uh, kind of a... Uh, head trader slash risk manager here at, at Fort Lauderdale location. Uh, so it's myself and my partner, Krishna. We're kind of managing a small office here uh, for seven points. So um, you're what they call a beast. So I guess that means that you're <laughs> trading big size. And honestly, I don't know how, I don't know how you trade so many tickers in a day. That's another question I have for you later on. Um, but first, let's get to know you a little bit more. Um, let's go into a little bit about your personal background and tell us, um, where did you go to school? Uh, where did you grow up? Um, so, <clears throat> so a little bit about myself. I come from uh, pretty humble beginnings. Uh, you know, not that I've made it or anything, but you know, it's a work in progress, but I come from East Europe, a country called Moldova, uh, for those who don't know, which is probably most of you. Uh, most people don't know where that is. That is uh, a pretty small country between uh, Romania and Ukraine. And uh, we speak Russian and Romanian over there. Um, so I moved to the States. I moved to Brooklyn, to New York when I was 14. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my parents are honest, hardworking people. And, uh, you know, I'm just out here grinding, trying to potentially, hopefully give back in the future to my, to my family. Um, so I finished, uh, like seven grades, I believe back in Moldova. And, uh, and then I went to eighth grade and on, I finished, uh, high school in, uh, in Brooklyn. I was on the swimming team. So I love fitness. I've been swimming my whole life right now. I'm doing some CrossFit, uh, loving it, helping me with my trading surprisingly. Mm. Um, it's kind of like uh, meditation for me at the end of the day. And uh, graduated college in uh, Manhattan called Baruch College, really good school. And uh, started trading in 2014. What did you take in college? So I switched my majors a couple of times. I was a counting major, but then I quickly realized that I cannot be sitting there and uh, counting somebody else's money. <laughs> <laughs> so I changed to economics and I enjoyed it, but I later changed to finance. So I jumped back and forth, but finance was something that I understood a little bit better. I was always curious about how money works, how money moves. And uh, it was, I think it was the right decision. <clears throat> so coming from European 
descent is europe right or is it yeah yeah coming from european descent i know i've got quite a few friends um european backgrounds and their parents um would not be too happy about them going into day trading for example so what was that uh what was that like I got a little bit of a pushback, but once they realized that I'm not just messing around, I'm being serious, you know, I'm, <clears throat> I'm taking my time to study and, you know, I'm doing, uh, I'm doing a lot of work, you know, they kind of left me alone. So you said that you finished college and your first experience in finance was what? So <clears throat> in uh, 2014, I was a junior in college and my friend calls me up and he says, Hey man, I know you're in finance, blah, blah, blah. And you know, do you want to, do you want to get some free trades? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, you know, if I send you this link to, I think it was Scott trade, you know, you're going to get three free trades and I'll get three free trades. I'm like, yeah, sure. Why not? You know, I am in finance after all. So mm-hmm. I have to, you know, start experimenting with it. So I bought three stocks. I was, uh, it was Apple, it was Berkshire, the B shares. It was like $120 at the time. And it was Plug, P-L-U-G. And Plug was really hot. Uh, it was running, it was really hot. I didn't even look at the chart. I just saw it on stock twits. And so I bought all three of them. And I think in about three, four days, uh, I checked back in, you know, my, my, uh, Large caps are kind of going sideways. I think Apple was down a little bit and, and, and plug, I'm up huge. I'm up like I bought it at 450 or something and it's trading at six bucks. So I'm thinking to myself, what am I doing with, with this Apple trade? You know? Uh, so I sold the plug and, um, I held Apple for a little bit longer and Berkshire for a little bit longer, uh, maybe for another month or so. And I really started trading when. Uh, I think the semester was over. It was winter time and I was looking for an internship and I just couldn't land anything. I couldn't get an internship. I had decent grades. I had pretty good grades. Actually, I went to all the job fairs and you know, I'll put on my best suit, the tie, everything. Well, what kind of position though? I, anything. I had no idea. Mm. Just something in the finance world to get the foot in the door, you know? And all my friends, they got the, they got like all kinds of like wealth management positions. You know, now that I think about it, wealth management position is just cold calling. So it's pretty miserable. <clears throat> but, you know, at the time I was very upset. I couldn't land an internship. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do my own internship. So I just locked myself in the room, told my parents not to bother me, <laughs> bought a bunch of books, opened up a share trader account, signed up for a chat room, bought a few DVDs pretty much spent all my money on education and, and to fund the account with whatever I had left and started uh, blowing up my accounts. <laughs> the rest wow. is history. And yeah. what year was that, that you were buying plug and investing in Berkshire? It was, it was 2000, either 2013 or maybe early 2014. I think it was 2013. And, uh, buying PLUG, did you just buy it straight? like just wherever the, the stock was at yeah, the time. Yeah, I had, exactly. I had no <laughs> idea. I did not look at the chart at all. It was just like a shot in, you know, in the sky. So shot in the dark. Um, but you know, it turned out to be a good trade and I went back probably a year later, I decided to go and look at the chart and it turns out as a perfect bounce play on a daily chart. <laughs> I scooped up, I scooped it up near resistance and I bought like pretty much near the top. If I sold it the next day, I, uh, I would have sold probably for a loss. It was a big red day. I sh- I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post that chart on my uh, Twitter after the podcast. Um, how did you so- move so quickly into becoming a su- successful trader with seven points capital? What was the secret sauce? So yeah, the seven points capital here is the secret, is the secret sauce. But to be honest with you, I knew that the quickest way was to learn from somebody. Um, you know, I, I like reading books about like all kinds of stuff, like all the self-help type of books. And they all pretty much all agree on one thing. If you want to learn something and be really good at something, you need a mentor. That's going to just cut the learning curve by a lot. So I couldn't find any good mentors online. Um, back then I signed up for, I think I had two different chat rooms and I was just like buying the tops and selling the bottoms. There was really no 
they never really showed the setups. It was more like alerts, you know, so I couldn't find a good mentor. And once I blew up two accounts, I had no more money left. <clears throat> I decided to try out the prop way. And I also didn't know which prop firms are good, which, which ones are not. And I got really lucky with some points, really lucky. Mm-hmm. I uh, applied to just one firm. And I went in there for an interview. <clears throat> I spoke to my cats. He looked at some of my executions. He said, you know, he asked me some questions and he decided to, you know, to take me in and show me how to execute things the right way. So, um, you know, and, you know, trading from seven points, it's like, it's, it's much easier um, because <clears throat> there's so many guys in there and most of them are, like not just consistently profitable, most of them are killers, right? So, and, and none of them are on Twitter either. So you can come up to any of these guys and be like, hey man, like, what did you see here that I didn't see, you know, in this trade? And he, he's gonna show it to you. So it's really something you can't, uh, you know, you can't do if you're trading on your own. Or if you have a mentor who's just an online mentor. And by the way, right now, it's, it's a little bit easier with that because there's so many legit guys I mean, you interviewed Smash, you interviewed Mike, you interviewed Jay Trader. These guys are all great mentors. Um, so right now it's a little bit easier with that. But back then I couldn't find any, so. Yeah, I mean, having Mike Katz as a mentor, you know, off the bat, that's pretty amazing. That's a good edge. <laughs> and so being surrounded by so many good traders, you, you basically went into that firm uh, with what level of knowledge about the market? Um, so I, at that point I've already day traded for about seven months part time. I've read a bunch of different books on technical analysis. I've, I've spoken to different traders uh, on Twitter. So I had a good understanding of how the prices move. And at that point I was pretty much a break even trader, but my commissions would eat through my, uh, you know, my, my capital. So I, I knew like, basic stuff like, you know, buying near support and selling near resistance, cutting losses quickly, you know, like wedge patterns and like very, very basic stuff, but nothing really like no microstructure, no knowledge of emotional awareness, um, like execution routes and anything like that. So there was a lot of work done after I joined seven points. What would you say was your turning point? Like at what point, and uh, being part of the firm or maybe in the months before that, before you joined the firm, did you sort of have an aha moment? So the turning point was just putting myself out of the comfort zone um, and just doing kind of doing the right thing. Um, like, for example, I would when I joined seven points, I would trade. I would keep trading these low flows that I traded before. But the guys there never traded those. They traded more mid caps, they would trade more large cap, mid caps, like cheaper ones, but with, a, with high volume, um, they would trade like Sprint and Siri and stuff like that. Ford, um, things that were cheaper, but they were moving with high volume. Um, so, you know, and I kept tra- trading these like piggies and I couldn't really be profitable in them. And one time cats, my cats just put me in a trade, like forced me to trade. He said, Hey Stan, he's like, what's your uh, max uh, size? And I don't know. It was like, thousand shares or something. And he's like, all right. And he shipped me a position into my account. He's like, all right, manage it. Wow. So, and I ended up losing like a ton of money in that position. So he took the loss. Uh, but that's when I realized I'm like, all right, I, I got to start, you know, like, cause, cause everybody's killing it in that stock, but I just lost like everything you know, I could lock myself out of my own account. So that's when I started really learning about, um, execution. So when you say he shipped you into a position, how does that work exactly? He, can you walk us so, through what that's like? <laughs> so he has a, so you, you have a regular account, right? And then there's also like a manager account that sees all the accounts. So he can, you know, buy a stock, grab those executions, right click on it and say, ship it into a different account. Oh my God. That's yeah. uh, scary. It's fun. (laughs) 
And the, the objective of that is to throw you into a position where you're managing risk. Yeah. To, to throw you into a position. So, um, yeah, so it, it helped me a lot, man. There, it was, I saw a proven path. I saw guys killing it. You know, I saw guys trading and killing it. And I, and I looked at them and I said, you know, if they can do it, it's possible. So I can do it too. All I got to do is, is just to ask a lot of questions and try to eliminate mistakes. Right. And, you know, there's the, some of the best tools out there. Like you have the, you have all the software, you have the internet connection. That's really good. You have, you know, you have all the perks and stuff. You have all the capital in the world. You're not, you know, you're not undercapitalized. So when I came in, I didn't have to put up any of my own capital. I didn't have to pay for borrows. I didn't have to, um, pay any commissions, mm. nothing. Right. So that allows you to, that opens up doors to new strategies. Like you don't have to go for, for three, five, 10 cents to make a profit. You can go for a half a cent or even, a, or even a fifth of a cent, you know? So rebate trading, we've done a lot of rebate trading too. So starting from microstructure and then just building, building it up. So trading bigger size comes from, you know, experience from doing rebate trading where, you know, I would sell, I would buy a hundred thousand shares on the offer and sell it on that same offer, you know, at the same price, but I would buy it on a rebate exchange and sell it on the rebate exchange. So I'd make like, you know, a quarter of a penny and trade a hundred, you know, 200,000 shares. So wow. yeah, different strategies like that, that don't really work anymore. So everybody started branching out to other strategies. <clears throat> So there's definitely clear benefits in starting to trade with money that's not your own money. I, did you find that you were more emotionally in control and were able Absolutely. to focus on your strategies? Absolutely. When I was worried about losing money, um, somebody, one of the senior guys told me like, what are you, what are you worried about? It's not even your money. Like who cares? You know, you lose, lose some money. It's not even yours. So who cares? Right. So, that, that, that mindset really helped me. I'm like, you know, I, I'm not, I'm literally not seeing any of my own money. So if I fail, you know, it's, it's already like it's company's risk and they assume that risk, you know, so much easier to trade with somebody else's money for sure. Uh, so, you know, this is really interesting to me because honestly, I haven't really met a lot of people that have gone through the prop trading experience and maybe I should have asked you this at the beginning, but can you tell us what seven points capital is maybe a little introduction to it for the people that don't know uh, what it is. So seven points capital used to be an execution, um, firm for hedge funds. Um, I wasn't around back then. Uh, but I think my cats was kind of the main guy who was executing for hedge funds. So some, they would call him and be like, all right, buy, you know, a million shares of the stock. And he would just you know find the most efficient way to execute it. Um, and then, uh, we started, uh, branching out into, um, having a trading floor, a PNL trading floor. So <clears throat> just placing trades and sharing the profit with the traders, right? So not, not, um, charging any commissions or anything like that, but whatever profit you make as a trader, we share that profit, right? So there's a certain percentage split. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and then eventually seven points stopped doing the execution business and just started having, uh, you know, hiring traders and, and, uh, having more success with that. And what kind of trading goes on at seven points? Is it all discretionary? It's mostly, it's probably like 99% discretionary. I think my cats hasn't, has a couple of algos, but, um, it's, yeah, everybody trades. It's all discretionary. People mostly trade momentum. There's really no like complex strategies. We tried um, some Forex. We do trade some futures from time to time when it's like an event, like uh, election or Brexit. We trade futures at night, which is a lot of fun. But yeah, it's just uh, momentum at this point. So maybe paint a picture for us um, about what your day looks like. Where, where do you go into work? Um, where you're, where you're located right now? Um, and the, the people around you. So, yeah, so I started trading in New York. So I traded out of uh, our Manhattan office. 
Uh, I've been there for about three years or so. And um, I wanted to leave New York for the longest time. I was just over it. And I wanted, I wanted more ocean palm trees. So I uh, spoke to the management and I said, hey, give me an office. I'm going to hire some guys, have an office, have a team somewhere else. And they suggested uh, Fort Lauderdale. So myself and another trader, Krishna, we moved down to Fort Lauderdale. And we have our own little office here. We have a couple of traders that uh, we're mentoring. And uh, yeah, we go into the office. I personally go into the office at about eight o'clock and, uh, you know, start uh, doing some scanning. And then everybody slowly rolls in by like 830. Um, and we're kind of doing a little pre-market scanning and talking about the setups, talking about the news. And everybody's kind of doing their own little um research and then closer to like 9 15 a.m we're putting in all the boros uh we're talking about what's moving what's on the radar and uh you know adjusting uh the watch lists for each other and maybe filling in some gaps whatever somebody is missing so kind of trying to work as a team uh, which is really helpful uh, because i may be missing something in a stock like something simple like a level on a daily chart, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, it's a long, but it's really not because it breached a level, you know, and somebody could point that out and, you know, save a whole, you know, nice trade for me. Mm. And it seems like a lot of responsibility that they've given you to, you know, management has given you this opportunity to go out and branch out and start another. Yeah. Um, yeah they have. How did you even convince them to let you do that? I, I really didn't even try to be honest with you. I, I just asked them and they said, let's do it. You know, and I'm very, I'm very thankful for that. Um, I really, I, I really am. And, uh, they just let me do it and I'm trying to not let them down. Wow. I'm trying my best. And I, I think I'm uh, on the right path. Oh well, man. Uh, it seems like you're doing a really good job. Uh, you've got some, you know, a killer following online. Uh, people have a lot of respect for you and I think it's because of all the transparency in your trades and on YouTube you're posting these trader takeaways I, I think is what you call yeah, them trade takeaways. Um, but I treat I treat those takeaways as my own journal so I'm trying to be honest with myself when I'm on it you know when I'm recording I'm trying to be honest trying to point out my own mistakes you know as if I'm just talking to myself. So, um, and people, people like that, you know, you can't be just showing your, your winners because you're, uh, you know, you're not honest with yourself. You know, you have to be humble. Like, um, modern rock says there's two types of traders. There's one that's uh, about to be humbled and there's one that, that has been humbled. Yeah. I really, especially like in one of the latest videos, um, I know you guys take turns on who's presenting um, their uh, trading day, uh, but one of the latest videos you were talking about uh, working a core and adding to the position, and then just sort of the emotional struggle. Yeah, so I got a couple of uh, messages about that video. People, people saying that uh, they really enjoyed that one. It was helpful. I think it was September sixth, uh, um, the day that we uh, that I recorded that one. But so basically. A lot of it comes down to emotional awareness. Um, it's something that Mike spoke on your episode three, you said. Mm -hmm. So psychology, emotional awareness, uh, not, you know, like battling FOMO, um, especially if you're trading these piggies. Uh, that's, that's a huge, huge um, part of it. So, uh, by the way, shout out to... Mike Martin, I think that's his name. He has a podcast. He talks about emotional awareness. He talks about leveraging your emotions. So ever since I found out about the podcast, I uh, started really thinking about how I'm feeling during the trade. And a lot of times when I'm really scared, that's when I should be adding, right? Mm. Um, but to work it backwards, I shouldn't be full size already. Do you know what I'm saying? So <clears throat> when I'm scared, it's usually because I'm already full size and that's when I should be adding. 
So the whole idea is basically to start scaling in slowly, building a PNL cushion. And when everybody is scared, that's usually the best time to go in full size. Mm. So that's kind of what, what that um, video talks about. It sounds like it's something that requires quite a bit of finesse, right? Because even just getting that or, or being able to sense when that moment is, is a skill. It's just experience, man. You know, I've taken so many losses, like trying to understand these, uh, these low floats, but it's more like understanding yourself, really. You know, you have the setup, you know what the stock should do, but you, you know, I'm talking about myself. I know the setup, I know what the stock should do, and I end up getting squeezed into the high of the day every single time, right? So what, what's going on here, right? So if you think about it, it's, it's just fear and greed. If you just flip it, right? If you, if you almost market make emotions, if you step in front of the emotions, if you sell greed uh, and cover, uh, if you sell greed and fear and you cover greed and fear, uh, then you should be making money, right? So when everybody is chasing it, when all the, all the uh, you know, dumb money is chasing it, and it's breaking out into new high by three pennies and then everybody gets stopped out. That's the, that's the top. That's the fear and greed. That's mm -hmm. a good, that's a good time to, to smack it. And then when the stock starts to drop, uh, that's when you should be covering some and paying yourself along the way. And, you know, I find myself <clears throat> saying when I, when I find myself saying I'm not covering a single share because I'm in the money right now, I'm not covering anything. Uh, that's when I'm about to take a loss. That's when the stock turns around, comes back, rips, stops, like stops me out by three pennies above the high of the day, stops me out and then it drops. Yeah. Right. So I, I just have certain rules where if the stock pulls back to support, I'm going to cover a quarter or half of my position so that I know that uh, I'm expecting a bounce. Right. And if the bounce comes, Amazing. I'm going to re-enter even bigger. Um, and I'm going to be very comfortable with it. If it doesn't, I'm going to add when it drops, comes back to retest resistance. I'm going to re uh, add right back in. So the trick is not to have FOMO, not to be greedy, but on the other hand, like be aware of those emotions, what people are feeling. Um, you know, when you're looking at the chart and almost like market, make those emotions step in front of them. Building on one of the questions that we received from the community, they're talking about asking you about how you combat um, fear of missing out. Uh, but working on a core, how big, like, is this, is this, is the core need to be big enough that um, you can size up from it and then size back down to it while still controlling your uh, emotions? Yes. So the core can be third to a half of the of the full position. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll scale in quarter size. If the stock is showing me that it wants to go in the direction that I'm, you know, posi positioned, I'm going to add to half size, right? So, and that's going to be my core. And then with the other half, I'm going to scalp the stock. So if the stock pops to resistance, I'm going to enter, it washes down, I'm going to pay myself but I'm going to still keep the core position. So it's almost like I'm scalping and holding a position for the big move at the same time. I see. So that's, that's holding a core. And by the way, I uh, was first introduced uh, to core trading uh, by smash. So thanks to smash. Yeah. That was one of the things in his uh, podcast was built, uh, working a core. I can see that he uses <clears throat> that to his advantage. Um, yeah, working a core, it, 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 I'll tell you, man, working a core like exponentially improves my, improved my performance. Uh, because when I started trading these piggies, it was like one entry and one exit. And I, it was, it was terrible. I, you know, I was risking one R to make one R at best, you know? Um, um, but once I started, you know, doing a core, um, I would, I would, risk one R on my initial entry and probably even less than one R on, on the initial entry. Um, but if the stock actually went in my direction, I would make, you know, three, four, five R. So completely, completely changed the whole, uh, risk reward for me. 
Great. So this leads perfectly into the another question from the community. They wanted to more, know more about how you use R, um, but I'll ask you, how do you define your R or what your R equals? It, so my R is based on the conviction um, in a trade. If it's a setup that I've taken multiple times and I have maybe even a spreadsheet that, that tracks that setup, and it lines up perfectly, then my R is going to be much bigger than, uh, you know, anything, any other trade. Mm. But yeah, it, it, it comes from a conviction, B liquidity. How big can I get without, you know, actually moving the price? Yeah. So in a stock like mankind, for example, that was, that was an A plus setup two days in a row. And, uh, I went in, I probably should have went in bigger. Uh, I went in full size, but the stock could handle, a little bit more, <laughs> you know, I could have went a little bit heavier, uh, but yeah, liquidity and conviction. Can we talk a little bit about building conviction? What do you use to um, increase your level of conviction in a trade? So, all right. So there's, we can break that up into a few different sections, but I mean, that's a very big topic. Uh, that's ultimately the goal, right? Of every trader is to, to have the, enough conviction and uh, to be consistently profitable. So, so first of all, um, you, you need a process. That's something ATO and I started talking about. And um, process, uh, I keep it very simple, just looking for setups, uh, scanning, drawing lines, uh, and journaling at the end of the day, journal, journaling the, the trades. So I track my setups. I have spreadsheets for every um, <clears throat> for every setup. I have a spreadsheet that pretty much just tracks the numbers. Like for example, um, if it's a breakout um, setup, um, I have certain criteria. Is it in a strong sector? Is it tight on a daily chart? Is there a good catalyst? You know, if those are all checked off, then you know it, it it's a potential breakout. Uh, right. So then I track the performance. How far does it break out on average? All those, all the stocks that meet that, that criteria, you know, it goes up, let's say on average, I tracked 50 of them on average, they go up 5%, take a couple of standard deviations, anywhere from four to 6%, they go up. Then they pull back on average 4%, right. And then they stabilize and then rip 10%. So, when I have that data, I know what to expect. So when the stock rips up 5% and pulls back 7%, I should be stopped out. Mm -hmm. But when the stock rips up 5% and pulls back 4%, as my spreadsheet tells me, uh, it's a healthy move. And I know that I can buy that dip with full size. So that's my conviction when the stock is actually doing exactly what I'm expecting it to do. And for that, I use, I use Excel, I use numbers, I run regressions and, and for every setup, I have a bunch of numbers that are backing it. So when it lines up, I, uh, I don't think twice. I just, I just go in. I, I think that's one of the most common things that I find about successful traders is, um, how diligent they are in keeping the data as it relates to their trading setups, as it relates to the market, they type, they trade. Um, and all sorts of other factors that I would never think of, including emotional factors, right? What kind of things should people be tracking if they have, uh, let's say a few longs and a few shorts? <clears throat> well, so what I track is basically time and percentage, uh, move, move in terms of percentage. So, you know, if the stock rips up 5% within, uh, 30 minutes, you know, that's, that's something that I'm going to record. And, and that's pretty much it, you know, just keeping it very simple mm -hmm. and running, like knowing the numbers and knowing what a failed breakout looks like also, you know, so, so you know what to expect on both ends, knowing how many of them follow through, how many of them fail and at which point it's a failed breakout. So the numbers, you know, you'd be surprised, but those numbers actually, um, they, they help a lot. That's a huge edge for me. Yeah. I've got very few setups. I, I have three setups and then I've got a couple, 
that are out of out of the textbook uh, basic setups that I will trade if they show up. Um, and I've been tracking those for a long time, and I've realized that basically the first week I had enough um, data inside of that spreadsheet, I realized that I was making better decisions because I was thinking more about the statistical edge as a whole as opposed to that one in particular trade. You don't need a lot of setups. You don't need 10 setups. You know, you get distracted. Three setups, four setups, two setups, doesn't matter. If you have a couple setups that potentially present themselves every single day, you, you can have, uh, you know, you can be a very consistently profitable trader. So mm -hmm. that's all it takes. One of the questions that we received from the community was um, how many long strategies and how many short strategies do you have? So how many setups do you have and um, how do you, how do you differentiate them? <clears throat> um, I have a lot. <laughs> I have a lot. I don't track them all. I just don't have time to track them all. Um, I do uh, use trader view to track, uh, like most of them, like I, I tag them. So I have a lot. And I can see like which ones are performing good, which ones are not so good, but it's most of my setups are, are basically like uh, a breakout, right? It could be to the upside or to the downside, right? So whether it's in a weak sector, it's trading near its 52 week lows, I'm going to trade it to the downside you know, and vice versa to the upside. So um, very, very simple setups that I look for nothing really, uh, nothing really crazy. And then the one that I really con started recently concentrating ever since the whole Bitcoin uh, craze is the piggies. The, you know, this is like pretty new to me. I've blown up a couple of accounts back in 2013 trading piggies. And it was always like in the back of my mind, I had to figure them out. And, um, you know, in January, I think I started trading those piggies um, and started tracking them. And, uh, I think, uh, I think I'm all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I'd say you're doing okay. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things I noticed about your recaps, um, is how many tickers and how many trades you actually take. Uh, how is it that you were able to take so many trades in the market? Um, and how many trades are you doing at once? Um, man, if you think I'm, tr I'm doing a lot of tickers, you should see some other guys. Uh, I've seen, uh, Krishna, I trade with Krishna. He, he could trade the uh, 15 tickers at the same time. No problem. But, um, yeah, I, I can have maybe, I can manage comfortably maybe five, five, six names. Uh, I usually have five, six open positions every single morning. Um, usually like what I'll do is if I have those open positions, I'm, uh, I always use hard stops. So I'll have stops. I'll be moving stops. So I'm not really reading the tape on them. I just have an entry, a couple of entries, and then I'll just be moving the stop. And uh, one or two stocks that I'm watching closely that are my A-plus setups, I don't have hard stops, um, but I'm watching the tape and I'm managing them with bigger size and much closer. So, uh, yeah, it's just, um, I don't know, multitasking. Yeah, I guess everybody has a different level of comfort when it comes to how many tickers they can watch, pay attention to, and trade at the same time. Yeah. For me, it's like one or two. I, I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. But I mean, I have FOMO when it comes to, you know, when it comes to missing a trade, you know, like I'd rather, I'd rather still put on the trade, maybe watch it not as closely, but I'll be in a trade, I'll move the stop, and I'm not going to regret it. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, it's, it's the FOMO. Awesome. Um, okay. So I promised people that we would get a little bit technical into this, uh, in this conversation. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to reveal one of your setups, just pick one of them and walk us through what the ideal a plus setup is. Um, <clears throat> well, we can talk a little bit about SSR setup. Um, that is the SSRs are something that I uh, myself and a lot of guys at seven points specialized that, um, for the longest time. Um, but that requires, that requires, uh, the routes. It requires the correct routes. Um, a lot of people 
Uh, I talked to some guys on, on on Twitter and they're asking me, how did you get in? Because, you know, SSR, you can't hit the bid, right? Um, but I'm like, well, you can, you can route it to the midpoint. And a lot of people get confused. They're like, what do you mean midpoint? Right. So, so I'm sure, you know, most of the listeners probably know, but some guys don't, uh, midpoint is, is a price in between the bid and an offer. So if let's say stock is trading at 550 bid, 551 offer, and, uh, it had a little bounce and now it's rolling over and you see the offer coming in and starting to build up, you know, that those are short sellers trying to get short, right? And you can see the bid getting really small. You can have, I don't know, a thousand shares on the bid and 20,000 shares on the offer and nobody can get in, get short, right? Everybody's sitting on the, on the offer. A lot of times there will be liquidity at the midpoint. So if you, if you can peg your aggregators to the midpoint, uh, there might be some liquidity there. So, you know, may, might get a couple thousand shares at the midpoint and the stock starts to roll over, right? So from 550, 551, it'll flip down once. 549, 550. Again, the offer is chasing it down. The offer is getting even bigger because now the stock is actually moving down, right? So getting in at the midpoint and, you know, the risk is basically that offer. So if the offer is gone, you can try to buy that offer or buy the next offer. So the risk is like half a penny to a penny and a half. And, you know, a lot of times it will drop from, you know, 550 to $5. It'll drop 50 cents straight down. I posted some uh, charts on SSR where it's just selling off without even flipping up one penny for hours. Um, so that's like one of the, you know, my best setups where, the statistics are through the roof. It's like uh, percent success rate is like seventy to eighty percent, and the risk reward is like like fifty to one or something. Wow. Like that. Do you, Do you need yeah. those special routes in order to do that trade? They're not really special routes. They're just um, they're just aggregators. So you have so there are different types of of routes that we use. Um, you have your regular exchanges your edgexes, arcas, BYX or whatever, edge, um, you know, and then you have your market makers. The market makers are the ones that take the opposite side. We use, uh, to take liquidity, we use market makers. They give us a good fill. They take the opposite side and they barely charge us anything. So we use market makers. They're pretty reliable. Um, and then you have your aggregators. The aggregators are basically, um, looking for liquidity for you. So they can be routing to, let's say, five different venues. It could be dark pools, um, market makers, or exchanges. So aggregators we use to add liquidity, right? So if, let's say, a stock is going up and I'm long I, and I want to sell the position, I can put it on an aggregator on the offer, and chances are I'll be the first one to get the fill. So aggregators are really good. And I'll be the first one to get the fill because whoever is buying, it's easier for them to internalize that liquidity in a dark pool. And the aggregator has access to that dark pool. Hmm. Um, aggregators are great for the midpoint. So if I want to get that mid, you know, between 550, 551, I can throw it on uh, like four or five different aggregators that route me to all the, pretty much most of the dark pools chances are there will be some liquidity at one of those dark pools and I'll get the fill. So, um, I mean, I'm not going to tell the listeners what, you know, to do like this. These are the tools that we use, but maybe, you know, you can ask your broker if there's an aggregator and ask them like what venues it routes to. Um, so though, that's a great way to get, uh, to get good fills at the midpoint. Wow. That's great. I, I really like the idea of, uh, using those dark pools to your advantage because anyone that's uh, that's read um, any of the Michael Lewis books or you know Flash Boys or um, dark pools obviously knows that it's sort of like cheating. I, you can call it cheating, <laughs> uh, but you know if you're able to tap into that as an individual investor, whether it's a phone call to your broker or whether it's joining a prop firm that will allow you that sort of flexibility. I think that's, that's really cool and really advantageous. And, and you know what, uh, all the power to you. Cause that's, it's just another way to try and find that edge in the market. Yeah. Dark pool. We use dark pools all the time. We also have 
right? We have direct access to uh, a bunch of different dark pools. And if you, if you watch the tape, sometimes you can spot uh, pretty weird prints. You do have to enable on your time and sales. You have to enable uh, like where it's going, the market is going to. And uh, like on my dark, on my uh, column, it says D if it's a dark pool. So I'm watching like where the execution takes place. So if it's a dark pool, it says D, right? So I can throw orders to, let's say, 10 different dark pools and see which dark pool executes. And a lot of times it'll be the same one over and over and over. So I know that, okay, there's a buyer in, for example, credits with dark pool, right? So I know that I can buy, he's a real buyer. He's probably going to move the price up so I can buy and then sell to him, you know, higher, right? Mm -hmm. So what they do, for example, credits with dark pool, what they're going to do is they're going to internalize that order. It's somebody, it's a whale uh, customer calling credit Swiss and saying, you know, buy me a million shares of the stock, right? So they're going to be buying that offer, right? So once they wipe out the liquidity from that dark pool, what they're going to do is they're going to go to reverse exchange, which is BYX and QBX at J. They're going to wipe liquidity from reverse exchanges and get a rebate. Then they're going to go to regular exchanges, EdgeX, Arca, Bats, NASDAQ, um, and pay a premium. So once I, once I see them wiping all the liquidity from dark pools, from reverse exchanges, going to regular exchanges and paying a premium for execution, I know that that is a big buyer and I'm loading up on the long side. So yes, and knowing, knowing which buyer it is also gives me an edge even for the next day because if, for example, a stock gaps down next day and the guy starts to sell, you know, I see a seller on the tape and it's the same dark pool I know approximately how much he has, <laughs> you know? So I'm like, well, yesterday he bought about half a million or a million shares and he moved the price up 3%. So 3%, here we go to the downside. For normal retail investors, like or retail traders, like myself, um, how can I get access to that type of action? Uh, is it readily, readily available? Like imagine somebody is just using uh, you know, sure trade or das trader via, you know, center point or Cobra or whatever. Yeah. What do we do? I don't know. I, I think I, we're out of luck, right? I, I, I don't know. You can call the broker and ask them for, I think aggregators are the way to go because aggregators usually aggregate those dark pools. Um, um and, uh, you know, if you do have those good aggregators, uh, on the execution, you, in the execution column, in your software, you can normally see uh, contra broker who you executed against. So if you're getting an execution through the aggregator and on the contra column, it says Credit Suisse over and over and over again, then that's the dark pool. That's the same guy. Except, you know, you're not executing directly to dark pool. You're executing through the aggregator. Yeah, like the amount of information that you're able to take in if you if you've got access to the right data and um, uh, the right routes, it's just it's such an edge um, to be able it's to play just, that. Yes, it's just another edge. It's a big edge, uh, but to be honest with you, it is slowly but surely going away because these algos are getting smarter, and a lot of times they mix it up. They're not buying, you know. 2000 shares every 13 seconds anymore that, you know, they used to be so predictable a year ago, you know, they're not as predictable anymore. So it's slowly going away. So, but it's still, sometimes we, some, sometimes it's a very clear edge for sure. Well, I would definitely recommend to people that are listening to give their broker a call and at least to tell them that they want to see full level two data on all of the exchanges they possibly can. Um, because I know that, um, you know, at a basic level, the level two data that you get, um, as um, uh, Bao pointed out in one of his videos, um, at one of his live streams, is uh, it's pretty limited. So you may have to pay a little bit extra, but at least you'll be able to see that full level two and you'll be able to see who you're trading against. That's a good advice. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's move on to uh, a topic here, um, just a little bit less technical, um, but still super 
uh, important for building conviction and getting that consistency in trading. Uh, let's talk about journaling. Uh, what can you tell us about journaling? Do you do journaling and to what extent? Um, so, so journaling, I, I recommend journaling to every new trader. 100% keeps you honest. Um, I don't journal as much anymore. Um, what I do is my goal is, um, eliminating mistakes, right? So I want to keep myself honest. I want to work on my mistakes. And that is probably the hardest part, um, for like human nature. Like it's very stressful to look back at your mistakes, right? If you know, if, uh, it's funny. Like if you talk to anybody who's ever been in a very stressful situation in their lives, like for example, like a car crash or something, like they usually don't remember it. Like our brain erases it, <laughs> right? So our brain, try, our brain tries to protect, uh, us from uh, going through that stressful event again. But uh, my, my goal is to figure out what went wrong. If, you know, if I took a big loss, um, whether it's writing about it, whether it's going, um, for a long run. And for me, that's, that's like meditation. I go for a long run and I think about the trade very deeply. And I think about what I was feeling at the time of the trade when I was, you know, getting in, getting out, was it FOMO getting in? Uh, you know, was it scared getting out and stuff like that? And then, you know, I usually write about it in, um, you know, in my own journal. Uh, so I don't, I don't really journal like every day, but I do, I do try to eliminate mistakes when I have big mistakes. Um, <clears throat> and also in building a database. I mean, that's probably uh, part of journaling where I'm tracking my setups at the end of the day, putting in the numbers. But I think journaling is important. Everybody should be journaling, especially the new traders. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, reaching a level of consistency. Um, it's been an ongoing topic throughout all of our conversations with traders. Everybody has a slightly different experience in reaching that consistency. Uh, so I want to start asking everybody, you know, what was, what was, can you tell us in detail, like the first time you actually reached that consistency, what it felt like and how you got there? Um, you know, I don't exactly remember what I was feeling and, and how exactly I got there, but I can tell you that, um, sometimes I fall in and out of consistency. It happens. Unfortunately, it happens when I get sloppy, you know, I have a couple of red days and I could be red on a week. And, um, you know, if I'm down in a week, then I, I did something wrong. I'm not consistent anymore. So over the weekend, I'm really, I'm a little bit worried, right? So I'm going back to journaling, going back to basics, but consistency, we can break it up into a setup, knowing the setup, knowing what to expect in a setup. If you're trading, you know, those piggies, you're trying to fade mankind. You should know what the, what the stock can do. It can rip through the high of the day easy and stop you out, you know, three cents above and then drop. So uh, knowing the setup and then knowing your role within that setup, right? So being aware of your emotions and, and managing risk and you should be able to, um, consider that the stock can turn around and rip through the high of the day and stop you out by three cents. You should consider that into the risk management and be aware emotionally that in a pullback, you should cover a little bit. So it's the little things like that. So knowing your role within the setup and knowing the setup and probably the most important thing is just doing the right thing. Right? So for me, um, I ask myself, in every single execution probably that I place in the back of my mind, I'm asking myself, what's the right thing to do? And this applies probably to life as well. You know, what's, what is the right thing to do? Do that. It's very hard when the stock, for example, is downtrending and it's bouncing and testing resistance. I see so many traders making this mistake. They will cover some because they're like, well, it's testing resistance. It's probably going to break out. And I'm going to give back my unrealized PNL. But no, like it's not, it's not the right thing to do. The right thing to do is to add. It's at resistance. Just add. Mm. Stop looking at the PNL. Stop worrying about giving 
profits. It's at resistance. It hasn't reached it. Add. That's the right thing to do. Right. And it's really, it's sometimes it's really, really difficult. Uh, all, all, all sorts of demons are telling you to cover it, but you got to just add, you got to man up and add. Um, and that's, that's really it. Just doing the right thing. And if you haven't done the right thing at the end of the day, be honest with yourself, look at the mistakes, acknowledge them, um, write about them and make sure you never repeat that mistake again. It all comes full circle. You know, you do, you don't have to do everything right, but if you do most of these things the right way, you, you will reach consistency. It's really not, it's really not that difficult. Yeah. The drawdown period inside of, um, a consistent traders, uh, PNL, uh, chart, let's say for the month or the, or two months, um, everybody has drawdowns and those drawdowns, you know, the bigger they are, the, I, I find the, the further back I have to go into my own, um, psyche and into my own strategy to just go, going back to the basics to really just gain my, um, my foot, my foothold again in my strategy. Um, you find that is true? Absolutely. Going back to basics. When I'm struggling, if I have two red days, you know, my cats told me that once. If you have two red days, you got to change something, right? So if I, if I have two red days, I'm going back to basics. I'm sizing down. I'm trading very conservatively, you know, shorting near resistance, covering near support. That's my trade. <laughs> Small size, just getting some green on the screen, and then I can get fancy. So for short, just going back to basics, keeping it simple. Um, and you know, most of the mistakes usually come from just psychological, uh, like ego, like, you know, psychology, like your ego gets in the way and you start throwing some ridiculous size, getting irresponsible, getting sloppy, you know, maybe you're tired or something like that. Mo most of the time it's, it's psychological. So going back to basics really puts me, you know, back in that frame of, okay, trade, trade well, do the right thing. So yeah, I agree with you on that. Yeah. So let's talk about increasing size and really just things that will get that account built to a level where you can sustain yourself and live the trader dream. That's a, that's a fun topic, increasing size. I'll tell you a little story. Uh, when I started trading, um, I think when I, when I just got consistent, I, I think I was like, I was consistent for like two months or something or a month, something like that. Um, I was up, uh, I'll tell you, I, I was up, like, I think like six or $700 I was up every day, which is nice, right? I was up six, $700, you know, one week, second week, every single day. Right. And then Krishna comes by my screen. He looks at my screen, looks at me and says, how long are you going to be up $700 for? And just walks away. <laughs> and that, <laughs> and that really he smacked me back into my place. You know, I'm like, uh Oh, it's time. <laughs> it's game time. I got to size up. So I, I, I think about that all the time. You know, when I get comfortable with, with the size, if I'm up like the same amount of money, approximately like every day, it's nice, but Hey, how long are you going to make the same amount, amount of money for? It's time to size up, you know? Um, at a certain point, it, it becomes a liquidity issue, but there's a lot of room. There's a lot of room to size up until, until it's a liquidity issue. So um, when you're consistent, when you have, let's say, four, five, six days green straight back to back, you're just killing it. You got it. I like to get uncomfortably big in, in good setups. So if I'm feeling comfortable, I, I'm not the right way. I got to get a little bit uncomfortable. I got to be a little bit on the edge of my seat. Mm -hmm. Right. But the trick here is to, you know, can you trade that size as good as you traded, you know, smaller size yesterday. Right. So you got to keep that in the back of your mind. Like I can't be covering because I'm too big. You know, I got to be covering because my strategy, my risk management tells me to cover. So trading, I don't know, whatever thousand shares, the same way as a hundred shares. It's, it's psychologically different, uh, difficult. Um, 
But if you scale up slowly from 100 shares, 300 shares, 500, 700, 1,000 shares, slowly getting a little bit uncomfortable every single time, that should, that should, get, uh, that should do the trick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really sound advice. And I feel like there's a bounty on my head the more green days I have, you know, like I'm in the Wild West. <laughs> my bounty's getting bigger and bigger. And like I, the longest winning streak I ever had, um, and it was funny because it taught me a lot, but the longest winning streak I ever had was two and a half weeks. And then also I noticed that as the more green days came, I was actually l- making less and less money. <laughs> so. Oh so, uh, yeah, I I can relate to that. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. But uh, I mean, again, what's the right thing to do? You know, the right thing is to not think about that that uh, red day and just to keep going. You know, just use the momentum and just uh, trade a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. And then once uh, it's a red day, size back down a little bit. No problem, no big deal. Those, those that's how you. That's how the PML grows exponentially. You know, when you're in a hot, you know, green streak going bigger you know when you're starting to when it's starting to slow down a little bit start going slower and, and that's that also i use that intraday you know when i'm uh, pushing a little bit in the morning a little bit heavier and then i'm starting to give back a little bit a couple of trades i'm giving back a little bit okay sizing down sizing down and then if i'm you know giving back more i'm uh, i'm not trading anymore right that usually happens around like 11 o'clock Okay, so we had another question from the community. And the question is, what criteria do you use to define what stocks are in play? So maybe walk us through what you do in the morning. Uh, How are you defining what stocks to actually look for? So I break up my uh, trades into a few different types um, of, of stocks. So I'll trade some SSR stocks, I'll trade some piggies, and I'll trade some uh, high beta stocks. And um, in the SSR stocks, I want to see a huge gap. Um, Obviously, it has to be down 10% at least today or yesterday. So I need to see volume. I need to see, you know, conviction, right? So volume to me shows that the move is meaningful. So pretty much all all three uh, types of stocks, I want to see volume um, and gap. So in the SSRs, and then um, and then the, in the piggies, I'm looking for a nice big gap. And fundamentally, it has to be uh, it has to make sense for me. I want to see some dilution. Um, I want to see that they're burning cash on a daily chart. I want to see that it's a former runner that likes to sell off after a big run. And uh, in a high betas, I want to see maybe a breach of a level. If I'm uh, looking at Cisco that recently broke out into new highs, I was buying the dips there. So I want to see uh, a gap through a level, um, a good catalyst, um, and some volume. And, and that's pretty much it. So I have a couple of screens where you know, I'll put three charts uh, from each category on each screen. And then... Um, Maybe throughout the day, I'll keep one one screen open for a couple of more charts that are like throughout the day, somebody calls out. Uh, but yeah, normally it's just gap, catalyst, and volume is what I'm looking for. So what are some of the resources that you can recommend for traders? Uh, so some resources that I use to read blogs. Um, a lot of guys... On- that I follow, a lot of them have blogs and uh, I have them all printed out in a folder and I read them and I reread them sometimes. So that, that helps me a lot. So you, you can see who I'm following on Twitter and, and these, uh, these, a lot of these guys have blogs. Uh, but a couple of books that stood out to me, the first one was uh, Reminiscence of Stock Operator. That's a classic, you know, for the three of you that haven't read it, uh, you should pick it up. I uh, re- reread it a bunch of time I find something new there. Uh, it's a cool story and it's got a lot of nuggets about trading. Um, good, good book on risk management is called Trade Your Way to Financial Freedom uh, by, I believe, Van Tharp. Talks about ours, you know, how to manage, uh, how to, how to manage your risk uh, and all that good stuff. And a really good book on 
uh, volume price analysis uh, volume profile is uh, called Complete Guide to Volume Price Analysis by Anna Cooling. That book also changed a few things for me. And um, some resources for you guys, trader takeaways that we post on uh, YouTube. Um, it's free, no, no BS. We're not trying to sell anything, just talking about trades, good and bad. And uh, yeah, that's it. Amazing. A lot of great resources and a, a lot of really interesting topics. I especially liked the talk about microstructure and the dark pools and aggregators. I thought that was really interesting. You don't really hear too much about that. So thanks a lot for sharing that with us and all the other insights. Uh, tons of nuggets in this interview. Uh, so I just want to thank you again. And uh, thanks at the guys for se at Seven Points for uh, uh, sharing so much about what goes on uh, at your prop firm. Anytime, Dal. Thanks for having me, man. It's uh, a lot of fun. It's always great catching up with Stan. Just a laser focused, successful prop trader um, that we can learn a lot from. So I highly recommend you head over to his Twitter channel at Chukana Trader, um, and that'll be in the show notes as well. You'll be able to follow him from there. Also, just take a look at all of his resources and the YouTube videos from Seven Points Capital Trader Takeaways, where you can hear him recapping all of his trades. Now, if you enjoyed this podcast, please consider subscribing on YouTube. Follow me on Twitter at Dell the Trader. You can also find us in a whole bunch of different podcast services. You can head over to activetraders.chat where you can see the article and the resource links uh, and all of the show notes. And activetraders.chat is actually a community where I screen share, trade live every day with members, and we teach market auction theory, uh, volume analysis, and advanced order flow analysis. And if you have any comments or questions or suggestions on what you want to hear on the show next, uh, be sure to follow me on Twitter and you can message me there as well. See you in the next episode.